Welcome to the Leadership is Female podcast, President and Chief Operating Officer Allison Barber for the Indiana Fever in the WNBA. We are so thrilled to have you today. Thank you. Glad to be with you. Yeah, so I want to have you kick this off by telling us who you are and what you do. Thank you so much. So I am Allison Barber, and I'm born and raised in Northwest Indiana, and then went to DC for 20 years and then back to Indianapolis. So I'm a Hoosier through and through. And I am the president of the Indiana Fever. And my job really is about figuring out ways to build the brand, connect our fans uh, to our product, to highlight the work of our our team on the court, in the community. And so really I would say most, most of what I do is figuring out important aligned engagement throughout our city and state. Amazing. Well, I know we're all big fans of the W on this podcast, and I can't wait to dig in more, but we have to talk about those 20 years that you spent in DC because you were working in the White House. You were Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense and Special Detail to the Office of Global Communications in the White House and are also a recipient of the Department of Defense Medal for Distinguished Public Service. Tell us about this post. What was the job? What were some of the challenges? And how did you land this role from the Hoosier State to the White House? Well, uh, the way I land these roles, this, I'm in my eighth career right now. So not my eighth job, but my eighth career. And the way you land that is you say yes to opportunity, even if it doesn't make sense. You know, you have to unpack this. So often women will negotiate against themselves. I don't know if I should go for that job. I haven't done this before. I haven't tried this before. And my approach has really been, because I have a strong support system around me that helps a lot. But my approach has been, let me let me do it. So I've, I go for it. And um, I'm a Liza Minnelli fan. She's a singer on Broadway. Her mother was Judy Garland. I think there are only maybe eight Liza Minnelli fans that I know. But she has a song that says, don't say why, say why not. Don't say why, say why not. And I think that's a good philosophical approach to opportunities and jobs. So uh, we left Indiana because my husband wanted to serve the country. So we both quit our jobs. He joined the army. Off we went. We left Indiana. I was, I've been a Red Cross volunteer since I was 16. I was fortunate to land a job with the Red Cross in Washington, D.C. And one thing led to building relationships and volunteering for opportunities led to each thing led to the next thing and uh, there were several careers in between the red cross teaching in indiana to the red cross to having an invitation to go to work at the pentagon in the bush administration and i thought that was my chance to serve the country my as a civilian my husband served in the army and i thought i could maybe contribute my time and my energy to service of the country and was fortunate enough to move into the Department of Defense in the office of the secretary. So Secretary Rumsfeld was the um, who I the department I worked in, in communication and public affairs. And I'll tell you, Emily, that was in May and in September 9-11 happened. And I stayed in the Pentagon for several years after that. Um, very intense and difficult time, uh, but honored to serve during that time. And from there at the Pentagon is when they wanted to establish an office of global communication at the White House. And so my boss at the time asked me to go and be detailed to the White House to help develop that uh, office, which I did, which then, you know, that's how I ended up going to Iraq several times. And I mean, it just, it's mind boggling when you think about my first job was a first grade school teacher that now I have these types of experiences, Uh, but they were meaningful and they were hard my first job at the Pentagon, my boss asked me to go meet with a four-star general to write a communication plan for missile defense. And I just remember walking down the hallway and thinking to myself, oh my word, I've never watched Star Trek. I've never watched Star Wars. I have no idea what we're talking about. But I realized I didn't have to be the expert in missile defense because he was the expert. I just need to be able to help him communicate to the American people. So, you know, they are intimidating. In, they're intimidating opportunities and jobs in challenges, but they're, they're worth doing and you learn as you go. So it's, it's been a great, uh, that was a great experience. The White House work was hard. It wasn't actually a good fit for me. And so, I mean, if we want to be transparent in this podcast, 
and, and help people think about things. I said yes to an opportunity because it was important to say yes to. But, but even in the midst of it, I thought this is not actually, it doesn't play to my strengths. And so you, is it a privilege to work at the White House? 100%. Do you serve at the pleasure of the, I mean, would I do it all again if I could? Sure. Was it a good fit for me? Not at all. But you learn. So two really important things you said there that I want to highlight. The first was about the presentation to the four-star general about the, the missile defense. And you said, you didn't have to be an expert. I just had to help him communicate. And I think that's such an important message for our listeners to hear that. I think sometimes achievers in these mindsets can get so wrapped up in like wanting to know and be good at everything when really, if you master your skill set, which for Allison in this in this position was helping him communicate. So did she need to know about missile defense? No. Did she need to take great notes and form a great story? Yes. Which was what her expertise was, was creating that communications plan to help him use words to, to tell the story. So I think that was an amazing, amazing uh, point there. But then second, the position didn't serve you. So making sure that you're asking yourself like, okay, this is a role that I wanted, serve at the pleasure, um, I've been so honored to have, but is this right for me? Having that check-in and understanding that it was good for when you did it and now it was time to move on and you did. Your next stop after DC, you were named president of Sodenta. Is that how you say it? Sodenta? Right. Yes. yes. All right, I got it on the first try. Okay, <laughs> a strategic communications firm. So again, you were employing those communication skills. So how did leading this communications firm grow you as a leader? And can you talk about the biggest lesson that you learned in this role? Okay, your listeners are gonna be like, I can't believe this woman is telling me this, the honest goodness truth. So Denta is my own PR firm. I ran it twice. So I always, it's hard to recreate yourself. I mean, this is a really hard thing to, because people see you for who you are. People saw me as a school teacher because I taught six years. I had my master's in education. I had to recreate myself really hard. So twice I, because the transition from what I was doing to the next thing was so hard, I did my own consulting work. And so Denta is the name of my company because I am Assyrian is my nationality. Uh, we no longer have a country, so we're considered extinct as a nationality. But one day I said to my grandmother, what is the Assyrian word for happy? And she said, Sodenta. And that's why I named my company Sodenta. Uh, and the whole idea was public relations with passion and purpose. Like how do I get, when you have your own business, you get to do the work you want to do, not the work your boss is telling you to do. That's a blessing. It's also, you have to go get your own work. That's hard. Uh, but I, so I ran my own consulting business and what I realized from that, the biggest lesson I learned is at that time in my life, it might be different today, but at that age and at that time in my life, I wasn't a great consultant because I, I like making decisions. I like taking risk. And when you're the consultant, here are some things you should try. Here are some things you should do. And I found that to be somewhat unsatisfying that, that my client was risk averse sometimes. So they weren't willing to try the difficult or go for it. And so I kept finding myself being frustrated that there's more we could do, but my client has to be okay with it. And so I realized at the time I'm better of, I'm better being the client than the consultant. And so at that time and that age and my skill set at the time, uh, my lesson, my biggest takeaway is I'm better inside a company than outside a company. Well, and that's probably why you made this next uh, career move to president of Western Governors University. And so WGU Advancement, the nonprofit fundraising arm of WGU Indiana and the chancellor of WGU Indiana. So your success in this role included growing from 250 students to 5,000 students enrolled in all 92 counties of the state, bringing back also this foundational education component um, of your career, which is it's phenomenal, the threads that we can, can pull through. So were the goals to grow in the counties, grow the number of students, were these goals that you initially set? How did you set the goals in this leadership role and how did you hold your team accountable for achieving them? 
the goal, so WGU is a university built for working adults. And it's a nonprofit online university and it's amazing. It's in, it's nationwide, it's terrific. When I was the first chancellor, so they, the governor at the time of Indiana asked me to start WGU Indiana and nobody had heard of it. We had seven graduates that first year. We had 250 students, nobody had heard about it. But the admission was so important that I thought we better be aggressive in the work we're setting out to do. And so every, every month I would get a map and it would have pinpoints, you know, pins on where students were. And I kept watching that map and I had this great passion of like, there are 750,000 people in Indiana with some college and no degree. We owe it to them to at least make sure they know about WGU. And what you know in marketing is that the, you know, your, the influencers are the needle mover. So of course, I'm going to tell you, you should get your bachelor's or master's degree. I'm the chancellor of the university. But when your cousin tells you or your neighbor tells you, that's an influencer. So my, I thought, well, gosh, if we could get students in all 92 counties of Indiana, then we'll have pockets of influence that will help grow the university, which it's grown to over 10,000 graduates. I mean, this growth has been phenomenal because it means that lives are changing. So every, I would keep getting the map and there's this tiny little county in Indiana called Ohio County. And I met with a researcher for the Indiana University. I went and talked to her and she said, oh, you'd never get a student in Ohio County. It's one of the smallest counties in America. So I was kind of, I mean, she's smart. She's a researcher. She knows the you know demographics of our state really well. And I thought, well, she's probably right. Well, do you know one day the map gets printed and I look at the map and we have a student in Ohio County the county that say they said it would never happen. So once I saw that, I thought, okay, we're golden. If we could get that county that everybody said you couldn't get, I can get the rest of them. So we just kept traveling. We got in the car, we wrapped our car, like painted the car with our logo. So everywhere we, I was driving a billboard, basically. It wasn't glamorous, but it was effective. And uh, my team and I just set out to say, let's do this, let's get it. And we had one county left, Newton County. I cold called. Newton County and talked to a reporter there. She wrote for three of the little papers and she was the president of the chamber. And she said, well, we have a chamber meeting next week if you wanna, no, it was that week. We have a chamber meeting on Thursday. You could come and present. So I got in the car with my team and up we went to Newton County. And you know, the whole way there, I'm giving myself this pep talk, like you can do this. This is, this is the last one we need. We get to Newton County get up there, speak to their chamber board, you know, their chamber group, there are probably maybe 12 people in the room. After I'm done talking, this woman comes up and she goes, well, can I enroll? And I tried to keep it together. Like I was over the moon, like this is what we set out to do. So she's filling out her enrollment form. I went to the restroom and I'm not going to lie to you. I was looking in the mirror and I was giving myself the best Oprah Winfrey. You set your goal. You got it. If you can dream it, you can be it. Whatever cliche is out there for success. I was telling myself this in the mirror. Like they said it couldn't be done and we just did it. I came out of the restroom, went over. And as we were leaving, my staff person said to me, I hate to tell you this, but she doesn't live in this county. She's from out of the county but she's a radio broadcaster here. And so of course, then I was deflated and it was like, dang it. But you know, within two months, we had a student from Newton County because that reporter who was a radio broadcaster talked about her degree, her pursuit, and she got a student. So we set the goal, we got it because it was important to have influencers to help people see what they could become through a degree. And so, you know, my team and I, I bought Fig Newton cookies for everybody on the team. We celebrated that we got Newton County and it was a really big day for all of us. So it was purposeful and intentional, strategic and hard work, but we got it done. Oh my gosh. I love this story so much. And the other reason I think the goal was successful, why you reached it, you had, you'd set us something very specific, very specific goal. And you had the, like the vision, the reminder, you had the map coming in that gave you that visual of like, this is the goal I'm, I'm trying to achieve. And I, that is just, it's so impactful and important when you're going after a goal to have those reminders and like that visual cue, I can only imagine what that did for your team 
And once you achieved it, you of course celebrated, um, love the Fig Newton idea, but also like they got to see the map full. Like there was a pin in every in every piece of the map. So I think that story is just wonderful, but it's also a really great way to set, measure, track, visualize, and celebrate yes. reaching the goal. But I'll tell you what's challenging as a leader is of my team, not everybody saw, everybody worked at it. Probably only a few people on my team were doing the cartwheel I was doing because they didn't value it. They didn't connect. And maybe I didn't do a good enough job explaining it, or maybe it just wasn't what they valued. Like the 92 counties was only important because it represented that we were providing opportunity to every corner of our state. Yeah. So that was also an interesting lesson to see, like some people immediately caught the passion and the vision and other people were like, they were just happy because we were happy, you know, and that's mm-hmm. okay. Not everybody advances, not everybody values the same thing, but it was exciting. Yeah. And I think that that is also applicable in our front offices today. You have those that are laser focused on the goals and you have those that are along for the ride. And, um, you know, you just got to find the best seats on the bus for all of these different personality yeah. types. That's right. And speaking of the front office, in 2019, you were named president and CEO of the Fever. How did you land this role and why did you make this career move? So the, the way I landed the role was a, I got a cold call on a Friday from the CEO of the company who said, could you come talk to us about being the president of the fever? And so, and I laughed out loud because I kind of thought he was inviting me to the chamber of commerce lunch that day. You know how that is like, oh no, we have room at our table. You know, who can we fill the table with? So I was surprised by that phone call. I love the game of basketball and I, you know, had I gotten a call from any other sports team, I would have, of course, been honored because that's really humbling when somebody wants you to think about it, uh, being a part of their company. I don't think it would have turned my head. I just love the game of basketball. And so that made sense. I think it's great for women uh, to have a WNBA presence. It's awesome in our state. And I thought that maybe I could put my time and energy toward doing a little bit more in my own city and state. So the work I was doing at WGU had moved to a national role, which I really loved also. But I've had that chance in DC for 20 years working at the national level. And then now, so so I moved back to Indiana. I wanna do something that helps my city and my state. This seemed like a good opportunity for that. And they needed, you know, the Fever had won a championship and they had some good teams after that, but they were, not as relevant as what they wanted to be. And that's brand building and marketing and engagement. So the things that I've done in several of my jobs seem to come together as a good fit for this role. Yeah, absolutely. You have been a great ad uh, to lead that team, but what have been some of the biggest challenges that you've encountered leading a WNBA franchise? Well, you know, Emily, we just talked about the Fig Newton story, setting a goal, getting your team to buy into your goal, jumping in a cold calling the reporter in Newton County, getting in your car and going to speak and moving the needle and accomplishing your goal. That's really satisfying. When you're the president of a WNBA team, you don't, your your job doesn't impact the success of the players on the floor. And so that's been an interesting lesson that no matter how hard I work, no matter how passionate I am, I can't get a ball through the hoop. I can't impact if we win or lose a game. You know, so I think that's been a transition that's taken me a while to figure out what's my leadership role when the actual product is so far removed from my day-to-day activity. Now I'm responsible for the budget and to build sponsors. I mean, I get the business piece of it, but the actual product of winning basketball games is way outside of my control or my influence. And that's, that's a challenge that I'm really still, you know, learning about. That is a tough one for sure. And one that I have a lot of uh, respect for in, in, the WNBA, the NBA, the NFL, where you're really marketing the players and the the winning action on the court. 
And if I can do a real, a little nod to minor league baseball, we don't have that opportunity because the team is always evolving. Mm -hmm. Um, The players and the rosters uh, are always changing. So I think there's, there's a lot to be learned from MILB um, from that the big leagues, you know, can, can learn from these teams because it's challenging because you can have the best business plan in the world. Um, but if your fans are only interested in your win and loss record, it makes it an, a big, a big challenge. But I will say, I think you guys have done a great job um, in that community connection and and staying relevant. And and with with that, with with your role, with the last several seasons, obviously we had to go through the pandemic as as one of the big hurdles that you had to encounter. Um, but what's been the biggest one you've had to overcome the biggest hurdle? Well, I think our, we're still in it. So our hurdle has been having a team that has really struggled to put together a winning season. So we haven't made the playoffs in years. Um, so we're in the midst of our biggest hurdle of rebuilding our team and, you know, trying to figure out, we have a three-year plan we'll get there, but we're in the midst of the big hurdle right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a tough one, but um, you've got some great personalities, a wonderful venue um, and a a beautiful community. So I'm sure that they will show out for their fear. Yeah. We have great fans. And I think that's the, since this is, I mean, so you're talking about leader, two leaders and emerging leaders. I mean, I think that's the, the point I'm trying to make is when you move from job to career to career, just because you're the president of a franchise, you move into these roles, you still have to keep reinventing yourself. Mm-hmm. And so my work doesn't affect the outcome of the game. What is in, within my circle of control? And so I spend a lot of time with our fans. I spend a lot of time with our partners because that helps the big picture of the franchise, but it's different than every other job I've had where my work actually impacts the success of the product. And so this is kind of how you have to keep reimagining your opportunities if you're going to change and keep growing in your career because it doesn't it's not the same it, you know it just isn't the same but we're grateful we have all these new rookies who are awesome we have a terrific front office support we have amazing fans and a community that loves basketball so I think we have all of the pieces in place and now we just need the rest of the team to develop and mature a little um, and and we'll get there yeah. And in your role as president, I mean, really you're, you're leading the franchise, not hopping in the car and driving across <laughs> state for, for a uh, chamber meeting on a Tuesday night, but you are leading all of the business units who are doing all of the work. What have been your keys to successful leadership of the team over the past several years? Well, I, two things. One is your is optimism. So you have to believe in, you, you know, I'm a Cubs fan. I have been all my life. So it's not about, I never have thought that people will cheer on the fever if we win. I've always believed they will cheer for the fever and be supportive of the fever if we align a value, something that they value. And if there's an alignment there, they will be fans of the fever. And so I think you have to have, you have to have strategic hope. And that's an important phrase, strategic hope. Um, I can tend to be a little too optimistic and excited. And so sometimes that can get you off track because it's not rooted in a business plan. It's just rooted in happiness. So strategic hope says, okay, what's, what's realistic, but then how can I really how can I keep my mind and my eye set toward the best version of this? And that's strategic hope. I, I, dim, I'm, I can't help myself. I do still drive. I'm driving three hours next week to a chamber meeting uh, to promote the fever, because I think if you look at our state, our fever in the city of Indianapolis, our capital, but we have basketball programs all over the state and girls who don't even know we have a WNBA team. So when I took this job, we started streaming our games in the state of Indiana at no cost because I wanted to build fandom in all 92 counties, similar to students in all 92 counties. It's like, if we're going to be a women's team, one of 12 in the country, we ought to be really serious about inspiring girls 
who play basketball or play sports, that they have a team here of professional athletes. Well, if, you can't build fandom if there's no awareness. And so I do jump in the car and travel and build awareness for the fever because I want girls to see what they can also shoot for in the world of professional sports. Yeah, I love your term strategic hope, but I would also say that you're a servant leader Mm -hmm. uh, because what you're also doing for your team is showing them that you're getting in the arena too. Yeah. You, know, you believe in it. You're hopeful enough. You're optimistic enough about what the fever have to offer that you are going to spend your time uh, being an evangelist and making sure that you can connect uh, with the communities, the counties and the girls who need to know that they can be what they can see. Yes. These hopeful youth who are taking to the hard court every weekend in a tournament and just so in love with the game. Um, there's, there could be a professional career for them in the future. And, um, you're showing them that, which is just, it's so inspiring. Yes. Thank you. I think it is too. And I think it's important and that's why, but you have to, this is the strategic hope piece. When I said, I want fans in all 92 counties, people said, well, you don't sell tickets in all 92 counties. You see that? So that's business wet blanket talk like okay it's true what they're saying is true we don't sell tickets in all 92 counties well of course not people in all my they don't even know about us to buy a ticket so this is where you have to keep building up you have to build up yourself too with your strategic hope of saying okay not now but one day we'll get there and guess what if we only get fans in 80 of the 92 counties that's great progress (laughs) absolutely absolutely celebrating the gain and not focusing just on the gap between where you are today and the goals. Yes. Very important. Yes. Well, it's uh, we've learned you are a Hoosier, and now we know that it is it is clear your love for for the state and for Indiana. Uh, so, as a native who then chose to come back and grow your career in Indiana, why? Let's let's show some love for Indy. I'll tell you the why is because my family lived here and I thought it was time for us I wanted to spend time and be purposeful about that with my family which worked out great my great aunt lived with my husband and me from 90 to 95 so our last five years of life we did together um so family is here but I'll tell you what's great about Indiana is that people want to help each other so check this out Emily I moved to Indianapolis and I only knew my parents but I'm trying to start this university and so I would meet with one person and they would tell me about somebody else to meet with and in my first 365 days, I met with 214 people. 214 people took meetings with me, somebody they'd never heard of, Allison Barber, about a university they'd never heard of, Western Governors University. That only happens in Indiana. And so I love the culture here of you know, helping each other out. We hosted March Madness during COVID all 64 teams played in Indianapolis. That means we all came together. Every sports team came together. Every college came together. This is what happens in Indiana is that it's got this collaborative feeling of how can I help you? Not really trying to think about how can you help me in return? It's, It's a wonderful culture. And I think people should come and visit us and stay here and hang out here and work here and love it because it's just a wonderful place to be. And I'll, I'll testament to that. I'm from Illinois and I've spent many falls uh, driving through Indiana and wow, it is stunning. The color changes and the rolling Hills and Indianapolis is just such a great city. So I will like piggyback on the championship of of Indy and also uh, the Cubs fandom. For sure. Thank you. Yes, we're <laughs> definitely aligned today. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, it's time for the final four questions. The first one is what is your best piece of advice for women today so that they can level up tomorrow? Well, it's advice I just heard a couple of weeks ago that made a ton of sense to me. And it's that passion is developed. And so when you take a job, if you're looking at a new opportunity and it has some things that intrigue you, you got to take it because your passion will develop. So sometimes I think people are misguided. They're like, oh, I don't want to do a job unless I'm passionate about it. Don't sell yourself short because you might have to get into it 
for your passion to develop. And so I would ask people to be open-minded about the opportunity for passion to develop because um, it might not be on the first day of the job. And I can, when I heard that a few weeks ago, I thought, wow, that's really true for the several of the jobs I've taken on um, that I took them because they were good challenges and I love risk, love, love the risk and I love change. So that made sense for me. But then all of a sudden I became very passionate about these jobs. So I, give yourself a chance for that to develop. I think that's such timely advice today when uh, we are looking at new opportunities and in the job market and what's available to consider that passion is developed. Yeah. So where are you traveling to next? Getting on a plane to travel to or job? Well, you, you told us you're going to a chamber meeting next week, but where, where are you I'll traveling finish. to next for fun? Let's put it that way. Oh, for fun. Uh, I am going for fun. My next trip will be a Notre Dame football game. Yes. I love that. That's one of the other great things about the fall, isn't it? Yes. 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 <laughs> right. What, what is your pump up song? So if you were in the starting lineup, mm -hmm. what would you want played as you're running out onto the court? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I have an entire soundtrack for my life. Like I have a playlist of my life soundtrack, but I think my walk up songs gotta be um, walking on sunshine. Oh, beautiful. Okay. And then finally, your favorite quote. Well, Emily, I have a lot of favorite quotes, as you might imagine, but I will keep coming back to a quote by Aristotle. And it says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. We are what we repeatedly do. So if you want to be excellent, it's what are you doing repeatedly doing to develop that habit of excellence, not perfection. I hope people hear that, especially the women, not perfection, excellence. It's a, it's a habit. Oh, what a great note to end on. You are just such a inspiring leader, a woman who has reinvented herself into these incredible roles over the course of a phenomenal career. And what a great leader you are for the Indiana Fever. Thank you so much for being a part of the Leadership is Female podcast. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.